financial boost, what lifting port restrictions has meant for Arizona's economy. When you're around town driving, any for border communities in Tucson and in Phoenix, look at the license plates from Mexico and look at their back of their vehicles with all the shopping. Crossing the border to see a dentist, why Americans continue to seek health care in Mexico. There's a lot of uh, offices and they keep on opening. Uh, uh, just like I, I started, uh, there's another dentist uh, starting as well. A precious resource, managing water in the desert. On a typical roof, a thousand square feet of roof with an inch of rain is a little over 600 gallons of water being dumped in there. Hello and welcome to Arizona 360. I'm Lorraine Rivera. Thanks so much for joining us. For more than a week now, vaccinated Mexican nationals have been able to cross into the U.S. for things like visiting or shopping. It's welcome news for businesses and families along the border. And for the Office of Field Operations in Nogales, lifting restrictions amounted to a 70% increase in traffic. On Monday, we traveled to Nogales. It's home to three ports of entry. Mike Humphreys is the port director and has served with Customs and Border Protection for the last 35 years. So this is primary inspection. So this is the initial point uh, a traveler entering the country is gonna come up to. So we've been getting ready for this for the past couple of months. Uh, realigning staffing, uh, anticipating, working with uh, governments on both sides of, of the border to include law enforcement and elected officials. And, um, you know, we, we were, long before we opened up November 8th, we were getting ready for this. For the people who are coming across, what sort of documentation do they have to have with them when they're ready to present? So there's U.S. citizens and permit, legal permanent residents, uh, who just need to declare their citizenship or, or present their, their immigration document. Uh, truck drivers are still considered essential travelers, so they just need their, um, their crossing visa. Now, what we started new with November 8th was the uh, fully vaccinated visa holders that could come in. So they need to come in, present their documentation, as far as immigration documents, and then declare to the officer that uh, whether or not they're fully vaccinated. Are CBP officers val verifying vaccine documents? So we want to focus on our priorities. We still are responsible for border security. We're responsible to stop the flow of opioids and other dangerous drugs. Um, so on primary, uh, they get the attestation whether somebody's fully vaccinated or not. If they have a question about that, they can refer to secondary and the officers in secondary inspection can look into, uh, look into it a little further. In Nogales, there are a total of 17 vehicle lanes between the Mariposa and Deconcini port of entry. Wait times vary depending on the day and the time of day. Over the years, the numbers have fluctuated. Arizona Public Media used CBP data to illustrate the movement. Right now, eight to 9,000 vehicles pass through Nogales daily, while commercial trucks average 12 to 1,300. This port is on pace to reach a record year with more than 380,000 trucks as a yearly average. You know, we bought in over a trillion pounds of produce last year. That's, that, Arizona did not consume uh, a trillion pounds of produce. So um, you see, uh, as you drove into town, uh, the flyover bridges, you know, coming in a, a, a small town like Nogales, you know, the state in, invested uh, $134 million for that. You know, the one, uh, the one purpose of that is to get, uh, you know, trucks coming through, trade coming through Nogales or going into Mexico, you know, a mile and a half up the road to the border or away from the border. So, uh, you know, the economic uh, piece that CBP does, that's jobs. Uh, created and maintained, that's uh, essential supplies that America needs throughout the U.S. Uh, food, cattle, cars, um, all of that come through here on a daily basis. In preparing for the government lifting restrictions, Humphrey says his team relied heavily on the agency's online programs and digital apps to process I-94 permits at the Morley pedestrian port. $6 permits that allow for land crossings and extensive travel into the U.S. Active for six months, many expired during the pandemic. 
In two weeks, officers issued 3,000 permits. Once restrictions lifted, Humphrey says officers went from processing 30,000 pedestrians in one week to 50,000 the following. Among the restrictions that remain in place are Title 42, the public health law that prevents many non-citizens from entering the U.S. claiming asylum. Yes, yeah, so Title 42 remains in, in effect for everybody, but uh, unaccompanied uh, children, um, we're still processing uh, those that enter. Another shift during the pandemic, Humphrey said, was illicit activity, which continued and increased when it came to hard drugs, including 5 million fentanyl pills and 8,000 pounds of methamphetamine, as well as a spike in internal body cavity carriers. Though the agency declines to release the exact number of court officers in Arizona, Humphrey says Nogales is fully staffed and it's evident in the contraband seized inbound to the U.S. as well as outbound to Mexico. Thousands upon thousands of rounds of uh, assault rifle ammunition being seized. You, we've seen assault rifles being seized this past year. We even uh, seized a 50 caliber machine gun. That is uh, an implement of war. A careful balance, he says, managing international relationships that include travel, trade, and public safety. One thing we have to uh, keep in mind is, um, you know, 98, 99 percent of the people crossing uh, the border here are hardworking, honest people just trying to come over to, to shop, to visit family, to go to medical appointments. Um, and there's a very small percentage that are coming here for bad purposes. So most people crossing the border are, are doing it for legitimate reasons. We have to find those that are, are up to no good. During the pandemic, commercial traffic increased more than 12 percent, and it's been growing over the years. To support that growth, Congress recently approved hundreds of millions of dollars in new funding to improve ports of entry in Arizona, and that translates into stronger border communities, says Luis Ramirez of Ramirez Advisors International. Approximately $440 million are going to be spent in Douglas in two uh, separate but combined projects. One about 260, 270 million will be spent in, in the construction of a brand new port of entry in Douglas, five miles to the west where the city of Douglas is donating 80 acres of land. Uh, and that's gonna permit the federal government to relocate commercial traffic out of downtown Douglas, Agua Prieta, to a new state of the art, you know, beautifully designed, the latest in technology port of entry. And then the other 180 million or so are gonna be used to modernize the existing port of entry downtown and really focus on expediting and providing a better experience for visitors. And that's a huge boon to the retail market, retail sector, tourism, restaurants, hotels, uh, stores. These improvements to the Castro port of entry won't happen overnight. So what's the anticipated timeline given that the funding is now essentially on its way? Well, th there's uh, two, two ways to answer that. One is for the new port of entry, because it's greenfield, I mean, it is raw land. Um, you can literally focus all your efforts and you can look at a you know, 24 month, 36 month project. The downtown port of entry, um, because one of the conditions for the modernization of any existing port is that you cannot limit the throughput capacity. So it must maintain operations at full capacity even during the construction phase. That's where those projects that have to be done in phases for construction, those will take, you know, 45, 50, 60 months because they must maintain operations during a construction period. And, you know, we haven't even talked about a similar investment going to happen in San Luis uh, as well. Let's talk about San Luis. We'll head west now. I mean, that is a port that has been, I mean, it's certainly very different than Douglas. So what needs to happen there to continue to improve trade? Well, you know, San Luis, the, the downtown port of entry, which is all non-commercial traffic, that's, you know, pedestrians, uh, bicycles, cars, buses. You know, we secured $152 million in fiscal year 20, and this infrastructure package includes another $147 million. It brings the total project to 298, 299, round numbers, $300 million that are going to be invested in downtown San Luis. Um, San Luis continues to be amongst the most congested ports. You typically see uh, hour, hour and a half, two hour waits uh, for people to cross at San Luis. So this, this investment is 
urgently needed. It's going to be a, just like in Douglas, it is a regional impact. It's not just a San Luis project. It truly is a regional binational project in magnitude. Luis, what does this sort of infrastructure package mean for border communities that rely so heavily on sales tax revenue from Mexican neighbors? The projects themselves, because they're so large, I mean, this is probably the single largest projects that are going to happen in Cochise County and Yuma County in, in decades. Um, the projects themselves have a huge economic spillover effect. As we were discussing, these, these are projects that are, don't happen in six months, it's years. That means 200, 300, 400 uh, you know, uh, construction workers and architects and engineers and you know, are going to be residing in those communities for months at a time. So the construction project itself will have a huge impact. Uh, it's an economic boost for, you know, Douglas population less than 16,000, San Luis 34, 36,000. And then you have, once the project is completed, the infrastructure is going to be a huge boon for trade, for tourism, inviting our Mexican yeah. visitors to come once again freely, once they're vaccinated, to come across the border in a predictable time, not waiting for hours to get across. So these projects have, you know, short-term impacts because of construction, but generational impacts once the infrastructure is completed. Luis Ramirez, thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. It's estimated that Mexican shoppers spend $1 billion in Arizona every year. During the pandemic, though, it's believed that number dropped by about half. Mexicans visit Arizona spending money at stores, restaurants, and hotels. Vamos a Tucson operates out of Visit Tucson and monitors activity throughout the year. Felipe Garcia broke down some of the numbers for us. If you look at Nogales, at Douglas, at San Luis, uh, about 70% of our taxable sales are coming from visitors from south of the border. Uh, here in Pima County, it's about five to 6%. So maybe not the huge, the, the, the large impact as you might see along the border communities, but definitely is gonna be a very strong impact. Just imagine with, uh, with the economic crisis that was brought because of the pandemic and not having that visitor from Mexico, uh, that was definitely something, a big impact to some of local businesses. Something that we notice um, is that hotel rates in particular, they have actually increased during the pandemic. Uh, if you look at revenue collections based on hotels, the numbers are not bad actually, but it's not because of occupancy, it's because of rate. Hotels have been able to charge a larger fee. Why? Because of compression of the market. Here, people in the US were not able to leave the US for, for many months, so we stay domestically, so that helped create the demand and people willing to pay a higher price. Now, with the Mexico visitor coming here, we wanna make sure that they feel comfortable, they, they wanna come here, that they have a disposable income. And now, something that, as you know, Lorraine, that is very interesting is that Mexican law, they establish a Christmas bonus that uh, is called Aguinaldo. Uh, contrary to the U.S., that it's discretionary to business to provide a bonus at the uh, year end, in Mexico, by law, it has to be provided. So in the next few weeks, many individuals are going to receive extra cash and they're going to have a disposable income. So that's why we're going and telling those visitors about opportunities, sales, anything that we can have. Uh, give them a reason to come here to Tucson, especially, or the state of Arizona and spend those monies here in our communities. What's the likeliness, though, that the Mexican shopper stays in Mexico and spends their money there because they've been used to that over the last 20 months? Absolutely. That's something that we'll have to change because of two reasons. Uh, number one, as you mentioned, it's uh, people started getting used to buying in Mexico and not leaving the country and finding deals and, and finding product and people actually making that product accessible and available uh, down in Mexico. And number two, years ago, Mexico got very smart and they saw our Black Friday and they say, hey, in the U.S., there's this great phenomenon of Black Friday, all businesses doing promotions and specials. And they started a program called El Buen Fin, the good weekend. And it was supposed to be one weekend and very smart. They did it the weekend before Thanksgiving. So trying to, again, those individuals that were thinking of leaving Mexico to go shopping, that they will stay. But now El Buen Fin is extending to eight or nine days. So it's becoming just a, uh, almost a week or more than a week, actually, of discounts and offers. It's happening right now. If you go on Google Businesses in Mexico, big retailers, you'll find all of them with very aggressive campaigns to try to retain those monies, not leaving leaving Mexico, not leaving the country. So there's those two factors that we have to go and actually change the perception of the visitor from Mexico. So if you're a Mexican national, what's the draw to come to the United States to shop? 
So still there's a couple of things. Number one is going to be the variety of product. I mean, the number of stores that we have here, uh, we see it a lot, with, for example, with kids and baby clothing specifically. Uh, there's many stores here in the U.S. that will offer the kind of products in Mexico is more limited. And still pricing. Uh, Mexico has an undeclared trade war with China. So you see a lot of products that are coming from China, especially clothing, some electronics, have higher prices based on duties coming into Mexico. So that still makes it more affordable and accessible to come to the U.S. So what we see, again, those individuals, and you'll notice, so you, when you're around town driving, any four border communities in Tucson, in, in Phoenix, look at the license plates from Mexico and look at their back of their vehicles with all the shopping. They're not coming here to buy a pair of jeans and one shirt. They're coming here to buy all the wardrobe for the, all the family and buying electronics. So that's the reason they come here. They will spend more money, but again, they'll be able to get more deals and better pricing and selection coming here to the U.S. Okay, Felipe, take out your crystal ball and let's look into the holiday shopping season. How do you see the next few months unfolding here in Southern Arizona now that the restrictions have been lifted? I think it's going to be interesting in, two, in many reasons. Uh, number one, you will see those Mexican visitors coming here. And again, you'll see them buying many products. Uh, not only for them, we're seeing a lot of times family members saying, hey, if you're going to choose one, here's some money. Can you buy these things from me? Uh, we're going to see some challenges because, again, what is happening with the supply chain in, in the U.S. and worldwide. So we're going to have some products that are going to be running out of shelves sooner than we expected here in our market. Uh, but we're happy, again, some retailers that are smart and savvy that they're starting to see those opportunities and shifting some inventories because they know they will be able to sell it here in Tucson, maybe not at a discount, maybe at a full price, but again, still at a decent price for uh, for them. So we're going to see, I think, that happen in the holiday season. We just tell people, keep your eyes open. Look for those license plates, say thanks to them, and welcome back to the U.S. when you have an opportunity because, again, they're leaving a lot of money in our communities. All right, we'll end it there. Felipe Garcia from Visit Tucson, thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. There's another element of tourism along the border, and it's for dental health care, which draws hundreds of thousands of people to Mexico every year. And though the numbers decreased during the pandemic, the border's proximity and lower prices continue to attract patients. Tony Paniagua shows us how. Nogales, Mexico is known to Arizona residents as a place to go shopping or have some local food. But this sprawling city is also attracting a growing number of residents who are seeking more economical dental care compared to U.S. prices. We met Becky Fassett at the office of Dr. Abraham Chavez Portillo. She drove here with a friend from Tucson. I have multiple sclerosis and I was on um, a chemo derivative drug for the last 10 years and it basically just destroyed all of my teeth. So um, it started from the inside out and so by the time I knew there was a problem, the teeth were already gone. Fassett heard about some dental options in Nogales, Mexico after recently moving to Arizona from the Tampa Bay area in Florida. Before I left Florida, I was given a quote for dentures for $22,000. And that was to pull the 17 teeth I had left and to do the dentures. So it was $22,000. And how much is it here? What are you being quoted? 5,000, yeah. So same identical everything. I mean, I've spent years in the dentist. Tucson resident James Sajka is also seeking dental care, and just like Facet, affordability is a major concern. Hello, Doc. Hello, James. How are you? Oh, very good. I'm uh, retired. I'm on Social Security, so I got to really watch my pennies. Dollars, too, for that matter. Open wide. I need uh, at least two or three root canals and crowns put back on, and possibly some extractions if I don't want to go to the the root canal and the crown way because they don't really last forever either, you know. Okay. Lack of good dental care and uh, chemotherapy didn't help at all. Dr. Portillo sees patients from all over the U.S. and Canada as well as local residents. He started his career as a dental assistant in Tucson and after attending dental school in Mexico, he worked for another dentist before opening his own practice. He says prices are usually cheaper here due to factors such as labor costs or property values, although equipment is about the same. I saw the potential and I, and me personally, I, I think that I'm making a difference. 
Um, I'm trying to make them have the best experience that they, they can have here in Nogales. And, and, and patients are responding really, really well. Mark McMahon was a dentist in Tucson, and when he retired, he opened Coyote Dental to refer U.S. residents to dentists in Nogales, Sonora. His business has flourished, and he's been able to expand to other places such as Tijuana, Cabo, and Cancun. It's huge. It's really huge. I mean, uh, we have not even come close to penetrating the market in Tucson. You know, people, most people don't know who we are. And then you multiply that times the whole U.S. And I've been doing it for about seven years, and we've helped thousands of people uh, save thousands of dollars, literally. So you have to take this pill. McMahon and dentist Chavez Portillo say finding medical care in Mexico should be no different than the states. Patient James Soika says he'll have to get a written release from his oncologist before proceeding with any surgery, but he's not worried about returning. He expects to save between 30 and 50 percent. Well, I was a little apprehensive at first. I didn't know what to expect or anything, but it worked out real well. Look forward to coming back, probably getting the work done. This year's summer monsoon was one of the best on record, dropping nearly 13 inches of rainfall across the Tucson region. For many residents, it's been a great opportunity to harvest a precious resource for personal use. Here again is Tony Panagua. Joan Miller and her husband moved from Maryland to Tucson in the 1990s. Miller took a master gardening class that introduced her to our region's native and desert adapted plants. She's been hooked ever since. But all of that greenery needs some water, as Miller discovered with her growing collection. We've had water bills up to $1,000. Um, and that has been probably about four or five years ago. And I was harvesting pretty heavily even then. You know, we had to come to um, an agreement that we would try to keep the water bill under $700 a month. Fortunately, she's also become well acquainted with water harvesting systems. Her rooftops and containers provide the pathways. Nature takes it from there. With the water harvesting that I've done recently, our water bill is around $150 a month. The efforts that Miller is making are being replicated all over this region, and Jason McComb has been helping out with the process for nearly two decades. McComb is the owner of Southern Arizona Rain Gutters, which he established with his brother in 2005. They thought they were going to be installing gutters part-time, but the business morphed into a full-time operation that's mostly about water harvesting. I would imagine this summer's monsoon helped promote your business, if you will. It did, but you know, ironically, before we even got the rain, this was a very, very busy season. Um, on a typical roof, a thousand square feet of roof with an inch of rain is a little over 600 gallons of water being dumped in there. The Community Food Bank of Southern Arizona has one of the most voluminous tanks in the city. It is adjacent to the warehouse on Country Club Road, next to the prolific garden where you can often find Brandon Merchant. He's the health and garden education coordinator at the food bank. The cistern behind me is uh, one of the larger cisterns in Tucson. It holds about 14,700 gallons of water when it's full. And what I like to tell folks is uh, that represents about what a family of four uses in Tucson every month. So um, that includes, you know, water for your, your laundry, for your landscape, for your dishes, for your swimming pools, all that kind of stuff. And so um, it's a great visualization so people can kind of see like, oh, you know, like that's, that's a whole lot of water that we're using. Here's more information about efforts to collect rainwater with the executive director of Watershed Management Group. The Tucson-based organization has been a trailblazer in this area and other sustainability programs. So we've been um, helping people live hydro-local here uh, for a while now, but we're trying to get that concept out a little bit more, especially this year with the recent declaration of the shortage on the Colorado River, and people are really wondering, what does that mean? What does that mean if our supply of water from far away is going to dry up. Do we have water here? And so we want to let people know that we do have a local water supply, that you can live hydro-local, and that we as a city of Tucson can actually live hydro-local. And part of that is learning all about rainwater harvesting. When people think of water harvesting, they usually think of the pipes and the flows and the tanks. 
that can be expensive for some yeah. residents yeah. in the city. So you're saying that's not necessary. Yeah, you don't need that at all. I mean, if you can do it, great. But we recommend everyone starts with rain gardens, with basins, and you can do it yourself. So that can keep the cost really low. Um, you can do something as simple as adding wood chip mulch to your yard, like putting down some mulch that helps reduce evaporation and reduces your water bill. You don't have to irrigate as much. So there's lots of little things you can do. You don't have to spend a lot of money. Take a class, make a little adjustment, use native plants instead of non-native, that will change your water use. So yeah, there's lots of little things that you can do to get on the path of water sustainability. As part of that, you have some training called Build Your Own Basin. We offer Build Your Own Basin workshops, both virtually and in person. This is the cheapest way, the easiest way for you to do rainwater harvesting. So a basin is a, a depression in the ground, something you can easily dig by hand to collect rainwater passively. And um, here at the Living Lab and Learning Center, this whole campus has these basins or rain gardens. And so through this one hour class, we teach people how to do that themselves. And then we send them home with a kit that they can do it at their own home or in their neighborhood. And what has been your reaction to this very abundant monsoon in 2021? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Happiness, first of all. <laughs> I think we're just all so happy to see all this rain, especially after last year. And um, remembering that our weather is variable, that we have year to year variability. Um, to see the abundance of this monsoon gives us hope, really. And we can see all these basins in action. And the cool thing is with all the extra rain, we're also seeing recharge happening this summer, which is so important for our groundwater supplies. Many scientists have dire predictions about long-term sustainability of areas like Tucson. Are you confident that we can inhabit this space and live with the resources available? I am, yeah. Yeah, that's the hydro-local message we've been sharing, um, that if we look at rainwater harvesting, if we look at gray water harvesting, using recycled water, if we are recharging and stewarding our groundwater supplies. And then just generally uh, improving the way we develop our city to have green infrastructure, to have much more efficient fixtures in our buildings. Um, we do believe that we can actually meet all our water supplies locally, and we don't have to bring in water from the Colorado River. Lisa Shipik, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much. And that's all for now. Thanks for joining us. And a programming note, Arizona 360 is off the air for the remainder of the year. We'll be back in 2022 with new stories for you. Thanks for watching.